as we who are involved in the science education arena uh, know very well, if you ask the individual science teacher uh, what do they want to be successful, they're going to say whatever it takes. Um, every methodology, every piece of information that can help them be more skilled uh, and more adept at the work that they do. Um, we do share uh, advocacy goals. And what we tend to find all too often is that as we approach legislators and, and sometimes funders on this issue, the, the common goal toward how we meet science education standards and these evolving standards um, is well understood. But there is occasionally a divergence between what happens in the formal education environment and what happens in the science centers and museums. Part of our goal is to, is to bring that divergence, uh, is to essentially eliminate that divergence, to bring down uh, any sense of separation between what goes on um, in the classroom and what goes on outside of the classroom in terms of intent and in terms of, of tools for, for success. Um, I, I have pointed out to so many people, to so many of our, of our legislators and others, um, where in, in the form of our advocacy, that the skills that we are seeing, the experiential skills that we are seeing um, in the, uh, the out-of-school environment are being applied almost immediately in the school uh, classrooms as well. And they provide a richness that doesn't always exist um, in, other, in other forms of, of training. So it's important that we show by example where these opportunities exist in our science centers and, and museums, um, how they can be most effective, um, and where we're headed um, in, in terms of new, new types of initiatives. So in, in that regard, um, we, we have several uh, initiatives. The National Governors Association, I'm on the STEM Advisory Council, has asked um, uh, that, we, that we bring more and more examples to the table. Um, today, well, we're very fortunate to, to have someone to, to speak on exactly this, this issue. Um, it's my, my pleasure, my honor, to uh, introduce uh, Ellen Futter, who is the president of the American Museum of Natural History and has been since 1993. Um, uh, she was formerly the president of Barnard College, and I, this is an unusual statistic that I get to say in addition, uh, that she was the youngest person to assume the presidency of a number of organizations, including Brookings Institution and Memorial Sloan, Kettering Cancer Center. I, I envy you for that alone. So, um, Commissioner on the Carnegie Commission on Mathematics and Science uh, Education, graduated Phi Beta Kappa, magna cum laude from Barnard, and earned her JD from Columbia Law School. She's uh, here to talk to us about uh, the activities of, of teacher education and support and some of the programs uh, at, the, at the American Museum of Natural History uh, and, and how it reflects on some of the great work that we are doing and can be doing. Ellen Forger. Thank you, but I, I now feel a little older, but, but very, very gracefully introduced. Um, and thank you not only for the introduction and for hosting this panel, uh, but also for hosting this entire event. It's been a very stimulating conference, and of course for your, for your leadership on behalf of science centers and museums every day. And thank you, Patricia, uh, for your insight and wisdom about science teaching and the needs of science teachers today and for the future. You know, as I stand here before you this afternoon, I can't help but think that many of you may be wondering why a museum president is participating on a panel about teachers. After all, it's pretty clear why Patricia is here on this panel about teaching, but as the Sesame Street song goes, one of these things is not like the other, and that would be me. Uh, of course, we all know that science teaching in the schools is in dire need of improvement, and that failing to improve it carries dire consequences, undermining outcomes for students as well as the competitiveness and security of our country. So we urgently need all hands on deck, and institutions like the American Museum of Natural History and the institutions that all of you represent have much to bring to the table. In fact, our institutions are doing more and more to help enhance science teaching and inquiry-based learning and are often doing so in both innovative and groundbreaking ways. As I reflect on the status of science education in our country, I'm reminded of the story of a man who went to a fortune teller. Fortune teller studied her crystal ball for several moments and finally told him, you will be poor and unhappy until you are 45 years old. Then what will happen, he asked eagerly. Then she replied, you will get used to it. <laughs> well, we simply cannot afford to get used to the poor state of science education in our country. 
far too much depends on improving it, including the need to develop tomorrow's scientific leaders and innovators who will tackle the great challenges of our time from the environment to national security, from threats to human health to energy solutions. And there is a clear imperative to develop a workforce equipped to fill 21st century jobs. Let me just share a few really key data points with you. Projections from the Department of Labor indicate that over 80% of the fastest growing occupations, including healthcare and information technology, require knowledge of science and math. Already, almost one third of US manufacturing companies are reporting some level of skill shortage when hiring. And despite high unemployment, according to the US Labor Bureau, more than three million jobs currently remain unfilled. What's more, according to the MacArthur Foundation, 65% of today's grade school children may end up doing work that hasn't even been invented yet. And we also need to bolster our nation's ability to compete on the global scale in science and technology especially. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development asserts that the United States' dominant world position, economy, and quality of life since World War II has been largely driven by science and engineering. Yet, over the last several decades, we have lost much ground in educating young Americans to compete and to lead. You've all seen the data, and I won't rehash it for you now, in terms of the poor ranking of American students in science. Meanwhile, other countries, such as China and India, are actively positioning themselves and their workforces for leadership and prosperity in the 21st century. Still, despite the acute need, some may wonder both why museums and other science-based institutions like yours have a role to play in enhancing science education and what that role is. The answer is analogous to Willie Sutton's famous response when asked why he robbed banks. He said, that's where the money is. Institutions like ours are where the resources are. To begin with, real things. From moon rocks to T-Rex, from scientific instruments to scientific demonstrations. Teaching tools par excellence that add the power of reality to learning. At the museum, that translates to a collection of some 32 million specimens and artifacts, an irreplaceable repository telling the great story of life on Earth. And our institutions also have scientific and educational experts. In the case of the museum, more than 200 working scientists pursuing cutting edge research in fields from theoretical astrophysics to microbial biology, as well as a cadre of educators. Our institutions certainly have magnificent exhibits and galleries, interactives and digital displays that not only bring science to life, but link it to life. At the museum, that means 45 permanent exhibition halls visited by about 5 million people annually. And we, as institutions, also have long-standing expertise in demystifying complex topics for a diverse audience of all ages, socioeconomic background, nationality, and level of educational preparedness. And now, we have, as well, new media that enable us to amplify and extend the reach of all of these resources and to sustain and deepen an ongoing dialogue with a growing and geographically far-flung audience. As a result, we, that is, the science centers, natural history museums, zoos, aquaria, planetaria, and botanical gardens, and such, are places of inspiration that do an extraordinary job every day of providing out-of-school learning and supporting families and kids awakening wonder and curiosity, the true gateways to student interest and learning. This, of course, is not new and speaks to the long-standing role that institutions like ours have played in the arena of what is called informal education. But as valuable as that role has been and continues to be, improving the current state of science education 
requires more of all of us. Increasingly, institutions like ours are an essential part, not only of the informal, but also, and with intentionality, of the formal learning landscape, demonstrating how community assets can be deployed, often in partnership with schools, to improve science education in innovative ways. Clearly, one absolutely essential element to improving science education is teachers. Many of us have long worked with teachers and continue to do so. For example, each year the American Museum of Natural History provides professional development to some 4,000 K-12 through teachers on site and online. But in the past decade, in an explicit effort to ratchet up our role in helping to address this crisis in science education and to demonstrate the contributions that our sector can make to this effort, we have expanded on these approaches with two programs that I'd like now to describe quickly. The first initiative is Urban Advantage, which I know several of my colleagues and some of our partners will be discussing more fully during a session tomorrow. Led by our museum, in partnership with seven other New York City-based cultural institutions and the New York City Department of Education, this five borough consortium takes the resources of the zoos, the gardens, aquaria, and natural history museum and puts them to work to improve science teaching at the middle school level with a focus on teaching teachers inquiry-based science so that they can support their students in completing a required scientific investigation. Urban Advantage has just begun its eighth year and has served 257 schools, 770 teachers, and more than 100,000 students. Importantly, a formal evaluation by researchers at New York University concluded that Urban Advantage students perform better than non-Urban Advantage students on required tests. Urban Advantage and programs like it across the country are not only having local impact, but also are providing templates for national replication. In fact, this year, a new version of Urban Advantage was launched in Denver, called appropriately Denver Advantage, funded by NSF. And Miami and Boston are now developing their own programs. In fact, I was just hearing about the Boston Progress a few minutes ago. And that is just the beginning of what we see as a national program. Building on programs like Urban Advantage, we are now launching our second major new initiative, the nation's first museum-based Masters in Teaching program to prepare science teachers in earth science with a special focus on underserved schools. Authorized by the New York State Board of Regents, and funded through the federal Race to the Top program, this groundbreaking initiative has been co-developed and will be co-taught by museum scientists and educators. Teacher candidates will engage in hands-on science and learn how to communicate to their students the excitement of scientific discovery, or put differently, that science is actually a great detective story and a never-ending adventure. Lily Tomlin once said, I like a teacher who gives you something to take home to think about besides homework. That is precisely the kind of teacher that we are striving to develop. These efforts in teacher preparation also allow the museum to be part of the extraordinary cross-sector initiative known as 100K in 10, which responds to President Obama's call for 100,000 newly trained STEM teachers in the next 10 years. Our first candidates will arrive in 2012, and we are very excited to begin preparing teachers at the master's level. I should note that this new initiative joins our also fairly new Richard Gilder Graduate School launched in 2006, which made our museum the only PhD granting museum in the United States. Both of the programs that I've just described, that is Urban Advantage and the Masters in Teaching, reflect a larger trend and indeed an exciting opportunity for all of us in this room. That is the changing role that institutions like ours are assuming in the education landscape and in society in general. Charles Darwin wrote, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, 
nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most able to adapt to change. We are living in a world of great, accelerating, thrilling, yet sometimes destabilizing change. The issues of our time defy traditional geographic, political, economic, and technological boundaries, as well as traditional approaches. And so too, then, must our solutions. In their book, The Power of Pull, economic analysts John Hagel and John Seely Brown argue that the convergence of globalization and information technology is precipitating what they call a big shift and ushering in a time of both great risk and great opportunity. In such a world, there is a growing imperative to work across sectors, to reimagine the roles of society's pillars, from universities, corporations, museums, and libraries, to governments and non-governmental organizations, to transform our working relationships to ensure progress and human advancement in this emerging era. Inevitably, all of our institutions are part of this great flux, and I believe we have both an obligation and an opportunity, as appropriate to each of our institutional resources, mission, and culture, but nonetheless, to assume a new and increasingly more active and more formal role in improving science education. Because here's the thing. Today's world is filled with seemingly intractable problems, but science education isn't one of them. We, as science centers and museums, have a role to play in bringing our assets to bear in new ways to improve science teaching and support science teachers as they do the great work of building our future. Admittedly, this is not an easy task, especially in the current economic climate, and our sector alone cannot solve the problem. But we can and we must, within the limits of our institutional capacity, make our resources more broadly available to address the current crisis. The future of our children and the future of our nation require it. As I say this, I am moved not only by the urgency of the situation, but also by a marvelous quotation from Scott Buchanan, founder of St. John's College, which I suspect will resonate with everyone in the room. He said, under the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, have you persuaded yourself that there are knowledges and truths beyond your grasp, things that you simply cannot learn? Have you allowed adverse evidence to pile up and force you to conclude that you are not mathematical, not linguistic, not poetic, not scientific, not philosophical. If you have allowed this to happen, you have arbitrarily imposed limits on your intellectual freedom, and you have smothered the fires from which all other freedoms arise. We dare not smother the fires of intellectual curiosity in our children, or fail to help realize the full potential of our teachers and that is why we need to share our resources more broadly. Thank you.